Welcome, everyone, once again to 41 is the Mike. I am Matt Derrick from Chiefs Digest, alongside Nick Jacobs, NFL draft trade enthusiast. And Nick, how in the world are you doing today? I'm good. As you know, I'm pretty sunburnt from the uh, Farm Estate sale uh, yesterday. It was surprising. Um, they had, I know people won't care, but um, you're going to listen to it anyways because you're on this podcast. <laughs> um they gave away 280 sales tickets yesterday. Um, and, and so they're, and then you double that by how many, you know, because families were there and, and kids were there on top of it. So on my grandparents' property, I wouldn't be stunned if there wasn't, if I double that, I wouldn't be stunned if there wasn't 450, 500 people there for the, uh, for the estate auction or whatever it's called. I don't even know what it's called, but yeah. So that, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people yesterday. That is amazing. And, uh, you know, once again, you know, condolences on your, your lost your grandfather. Um, those those things can be tough and they can be oh, yeah. crazy because I I was not there for for uh, Nancy's uh, grandmother's estate sale. But um, people were wanting to try and buy built in furniture out of the house. I mean, those they, they will buy anything that is not nailed down and then some. Well, luckily everything was outdoors on, uh, on the, on the land around the area there. And, um, yeah, the, the house was locked up. <laughs> so there wasn't, weren't able to get into that one and see that one, but I got a, as you can see, got a bad, I got my first normal, uh, sunburn of the year. That's my tradition. First time of the year, get a nice little sun. So it'll be, it'll be lesser. Get ready for chiefs OTAs that way, you know? There you go. I mean, uh, that's exactly when you when you toughen up the skin when you're on the Chiefs beat is mm -hmm. getting out there for OTAs and standing on the practice field for a couple hours. That will absolutely get it out of you because um, I, a great little story. My first year on the beat, um, I'd started a training camp, and so I'd never you know covered a really you know practice off season at at. at you know, the facility. And I was just used to in season practices. So um wasn't used to the fact that when you got the rookie mini camp, that they let the media watch the entire practice. I was expecting that we were just gonna get the 15 minutes of stretch and then they were gonna kick us out. Wasn't really thinking ahead. Went out there for my first rookie mini camp practice and uh got it was uh like a one of those May 5th, 98 degree real mm. early days. Yeah. Um didn't have my hat with me, no sunscreen, wasn't prepared. Uh -huh. I was out there for like about 20, 30 minutes when I went to the PR guy. And I was like, hey, do we not go in during this? And he's like, oh, no, you get to watch the whole thing. And that's great, but I wasn't <laughs> really prepared for it. So, yeah, I got one of the I, – I, I managed to get somebody to loan me some sunscreen and at least applied it late. So, otherwise, I think I would have been a lobster, but – I'm glad yeah, you didn't tell him that. I'm glad you didn't tough. tell him I charged you five bucks. No, I'm just tough kidding. win. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Well, Nick, you had a lot of people out at your your grandmother's house looking for deals, mm -hmm. and right now there are I know 32 general managers who are out looking for deals. Yeah. Because, you know, right now you, you think that the teams are in their war rooms and they're looking at their draft boards and trying to figure out who they're going to take at what position. But there's something else that goes on at every level of NFL, every NFL front office right now. And that is that you are calling and texting with everybody you know to find out, you know, as much information that you can about what other teams are looking for, what they need, which of their players that maybe they want to unload, which of your players are available. And more specifically, Hey, if you're on the clock and we want your pick, what would it cost to get it? And that's a conversation that, you know, I mean, when when the Chiefs moved up to get Patrick Mahomes, John Dorsey was having that conversation with the Bills going back to February and March. So that's not something that just comes up on, on draft week. That is ongoing throughout the entire process. And it really starts to heat up right now. And we're going to we're talking about the edge rushers in this year's class and the ones that make the most sense for the Chiefs. But we want to start out by talking about if the Chiefs want to make a trade, if the Chiefs want to make a deal, what would it look like? What would it cost them? What would be the resources they have to put into it? And, you know, Nick, there's there's really three somewhat reasonable scenarios um, one would be that the Chiefs move into the top 10. 
to get a player that they absolutely want. This is a player that they've got a top 15 grade on, yeah. probably more like they think is one of the best players in the draft, one of the best, well, is the best player at their position and isn't going to be available elsewhere. There's a scenario where one of their top 15 players falls into the 20s, a.k.a. Trent McDuffie, and now you're looking to move into the mid-20s to go get them. And then there's another scenario where you're 32, there's nobody you like, and you want to trade back. So let's take a look at all three of those scenarios, and let, let's start with the first one, because yeah. even though it may seem unlikely, because you know you would talk about maybe usually going for a quarterback, um, you and I have a draft crush for whom we would trade up to go get in the first yeah. round. So let's say that. Let's say that the Chiefs have a player, and honestly, you know, it could be a receiver, it could be a tackle, a couple of one, you know, a couple of their need areas. Maybe they wanted to get into the top ten to get what they think is a is a you know a transitional franchise decade player. What are you looking at, Nick? And who are you talking to right now? Yeah. Um, so I'll start wandering her a bit. I'll even give you the players too. Um, it's Joe Alt. Who could be your franchise left tackle for the for the next decade, and you have that position nailed down. You don't have a turnstile of people running through, whether it's Donovan Smith and Orlando Brown and Wanya Morris and somebody else, and like you know, you don't keep having to wonder who's going to fill the role uh, that's been vacated since Eric Fisher was able to kind of lock that down from 2013 until the Achilles injury in 2020. So you had a lot of stability there, both for Alex Smith and for Patrick Mahomes up until that point. And then ever since they lost Mitchell Schwartz with the back injury and Eric Fisher to the uh, Achilles, they've never been able to really, you know, maintain the overall consistency at tackle and <clears throat> have that not be one of the less worry, which is kind of crazy considering this is the time where your tackle play is <laughs> with the franchise quarterback. Is, is what you really want it the most. And and in some ways, here's the, here's the reality. You're trying to protect Mahomes' mobility for as long as you can. Because the more hits he takes over time, you know, that's going to wear that down and that makes it a little bit quicker, you, you know. And don't get me wrong, Bobby and Mahomes do a phenomenal job, and they've kept him, prevented him from a lot of injuries and the flexibility, pliability, all that stuff that they do. Like is gonna make it the best, but from a Chiefs perspective, you want to give them even more opportunities for that training to, you know, be you know be able to pay off up until his late thirties. And those hits, no matter what you do, just the, over time, those hits kind of wear down. You know, they wear a player down on the back end of their career. Maybe not in the moment or afterwards, to where you know it's just like taking. It's like a, it's like a big, I'm going to use food here, it's like a cake or a pie or whatever. And you take a little piece here, 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 and here. And then before you know it, you only got so much left. And that's kind of what I consider the back end of a career based on how many hits somebody takes. So with that, I think Joe Alt, that's why he would be key. And then obviously Brock Bowers is another individual that I think if the Chiefs are going to make a play up in that region, that's what they're going to have to do for somebody of his potential caliber. So the number one team that I think you're looking at that you're trying to work with would be the Chicago Bears at nine. You have the previous relationship with Ryan Poles. He's got the number nine pick, and that's going to be easy for him to shop if he doesn't want to get a top receiver. And the Bears don't have a lot of picks in this draft. And Ryan Poles is savvy is a savvy enough general manager that I think, even though he's only been in the in the captain's chair for a couple of years now, anytime he can get a crack at Something like 32. So think the so for the Chiefs, they'd have to give up a 32nd pick. They'd have to give up a third, whether it was probably this year or the following year um, in 2025. And then they would have to give up a first in 2025. That's that's the cost to get up and in, into the definitely into the top 10. And you may be able to throttle back a little bit if it's in that 15 to 20 range. To where maybe you don't have to give up one, but you'd have to give up a second round pick. You just have to decide if you want to be this year or next year. And, and then if you get in that range of the 20s, that's when you can do a first and a third. You just got to decide with which one you want to do for this year or next year. And the key for somebody like Ryan Poles is if they have that 32nd pick, as long as there's a player that's dropped that somebody wants and they potentially want that fifth-year option on, or it's just too good a value, and they don't want the Panthers to get them at 33, you know, at 33, then 
that 32 pick is valuable for polls to trade down again to be able to pick up, you know, a second rounder and maybe a third or a second and fourth and be able to add on uh, more draft capital that they that the Bears need to really kind of build around Caleb Williams in the top 100. So if you're looking at team, I mean, we'll do this again in a couple of weeks, but I mean, yeah, the Bears is kind of my money spot at nine if you're trying to get there. The Vikings would be at 11. Um, I think the Jets would be a little bit, I think the Jets would be a little bit more difficult because that general manager is in win now mode and he really doesn't care about what's going on next year because this thing falls apart. It may fall apart pretty quick in New York. So that's going to be, that's going to be a big spot if you're trying to get a tackle at nine for the chiefs 11 with the Vikings. If they miss out on quarterbacks, I don't think they will, but if they miss out on quarterbacks, that would be the spot. And then potentially, even if they do trade, with whoever the team is at that point, that team would then go to 11 and 23. And as long as it's not an AFC, as long as it's not an AFC team, the Chiefs would have a chance at both those spots at 11 and 23 to try to make a move if there's somebody that they want. So, um, yeah, once you get to that 20 range, I think, I think you're looking at you at least call Jacksonville at 17. And you talk to the Rams at 19. Those, I think, are still going to take a little bit more. But I think with Howie at 22 and whoever has 23, I think those are going to be your money spots if you're trying to get up there. Just like last year when the Chiefs were trying to get up for Zay Flowers, allegedly, um, <laughs> that you know that they weren't able to. But I think that's a spot if you're in that 22 range. That's if a tackle dropped you weren't expecting or if, or if a wide receiver dropped you weren't expecting. Otherwise, you just kind of stand pat at 32 and make sure there's no offers come in from somebody else before you take somebody. Because the reality is once you're at 32, you're picking somebody who's going to go on most people's uh, draft guides or whatever that they're evaluating as a second-round grade. Like, you know, that's just what's going to happen after you get 18 or 20 picks into the first round. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree, and I would, I would probably expand the group by one, and not that I'm expecting that player to be available, because once again, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. is going to be a top five player. Mm -hmm. So, you know, getting into the top five, that's that's unreasonable. I mean, that would take you too much to do. If you're looking to get into the top ten, you know, your number seven is probably about as high as the Chiefs can afford, right. and that to me would be absolutely what you're talking about. First year, this year's one, next year's one, the third from Tennessee should get it done. Um, you know, always possible you might have to throw another pick, but that should get you done. And once again, I mean, I, I think Brett Veach only does that if there's a, you know, it's not just a top 15 player. It's probably more like a top five player that he think has slid and is somebody that you picture as being a foundational part of your team for the next 10 years. And those guys, I mean, Bowers... Alt, and I'll throw Harrison in there for my pick. I mean, those are guys that I would do it for. Mm -hmm. um, your teams, I'm, I'm with you because especially there's a couple of them, and you know the Cardinals are not a team that you know you're thinking you can go up and get number four. But the Cardinals are important to me because they've got 27, and 27 is right in front of Buffalo. And if you're in Kansas City and you're sitting at 32, and you're Brett Veach and you want a wide receiver, if you haven't made your move yet. You better get the 27 because there's a chance that Buffalo might take your guy. So that to me, I mean, if your receiver that you want is available at 27, that's a spot where you have to go get it. Looking at the numbers at the you know different draft charts, and if you know you use the simulators on like PFF, you know Chiefs 32 and that third from Tennessee would get you probably to 24 or 25. You know, Dallas is at 24, so they're a bit mercurial. I think you'd probably have to throw it a bit more for Jerry to, to get that because he's he's kind of greedy. Um, <laughs> I think you could get, if you're Kansas City, the first and that third from Tennessee would get you to 24, you know, or, or 25. Um, higher than that, you might have to kick in a late round pick, but, you know, and that's where the Minnesota comes in at 23. You know, so to me, Minnesota and Arizona are a couple of big teams. Um, if you're the Chiefs and you're wanting to make a trade into the 20s, though, like I've been saying, there's a stretch from 22 to 27 that right now is all NFC teams. 
And at least NFC teams have shown a little bit more willingness to maybe deal with the Chiefs, especially in a draft situation. So, you know, I, I don't I I'm expecting the Buffalo Bills to never trade with the Chiefs again because the last two draft trades have not gone in their favor. <laughs> well, in one of them, they weren't involved, but the Chiefs just traded in front of them to get the guy that the Buffalo Bills wanted uh, when they took McDuffie over uh, Kyrie Elam. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, those to me. Now, the other possibility is that Chiefs get to 32, don't really like what's sitting there, and do want to move out of it. That's the opportunity, Nick, where they could get some picks. And that's critical to me because, you know, starting to get into the, you know, looking at the draft and everything – I will say that the end of the second round, to me, is really depressing. Because to me, at least in, in, in the, the few scenarios that I have gone through, every time I get to the bottom of the second round, I got a lot of third round picks. That's just, to me, not a lot of value. I mean, there's kind of a pocket there, it seems to me. Like, there's a gap, and there usually is every year a gap, between maybe the top you know, 15 players versus the next 30 players. And then there's a drop off where kind of everybody's a third round pick once you get to the end of the second round. Mm -hmm. So I'm the chiefs. I, I mean, you could, if you move out of that 32 and get somewhere, you know, late thirties, early forties, you might still be able to get the player you want, but now you've also got the ability, you know, to even move up in the second round from 64. You could walk away with two top 50 players, Nick, if you play your cards, right? Right. And that's and that's on the back end. That's the other part that you're going to have to consider. And it's stuff I have done multiple times <laughs> in the mock drafts just to see what would potentially be available. And that's where and I know it's mock draft by simulators and everything. So it's not how it's obviously going to go in the NFL draft. But there has been times where I've been able to pick up an offensive tackle and a defensive tackle in the second round there and still be able to get a wide receiver that I like there in the third round. And even in the fourth and fifth round. So, yeah, it's going to be the the big thing is uh, I'm going to be interested to see when draft night rolls around is what do the Chiefs, how many receivers do they take? How many receivers, are they going to get an impact receiver? Or are they going to just get receivers to pair with what they have on staff? Offensive tackle-wise, how aggressive are they? Or do they kind of just let the board go as it does? And if they get it, great. If not, then they'll magically sign somebody after the draft and sit, you know, kind of continue to kick that can down the road. Um, and then, you know, you, you go from there. But, I mean, it's becoming clearer and clearer to me that if this draft they have to come away with an offensive tackle and wide receiver to really kind of just help situate themselves ahead of, the 2025 free agency choices they've got. And then that's something you and I are going to do in a, a podcast down the road is we'll start going over kind of what's ahead um, in terms of when you're looking at the roster over the next three years, what the Chiefs are going to have to brace for in this draft to prepare for the next two years roster-wise so they're not scrambling to fill in all these, you know, all these gaps at once after they've already happened but can kind of be ahead of it ahead of that curve yeah and uh my first mock draft is already up over at chief's digest i read uh, it do you want to check I it out i quoted in it <laughs> I, you were quoted in it and i i don't know i would expect i would expect it there i, I don't know I, I i would think that a lot of chiefs fans would probably not like it but <laughs> but i i would i did exactly what you're saying there nick there's a couple of spots where i took players that i don't think that maybe we've always been talking about and haven't been hot button and there's certainly not anybody that i would take in the maybe the first or second rounds but when you start looking at the roster and certainly for 2025 and you're looking okay i don't have a justin reed under contract you know i've got potentially having all three of my starting interior offensive linemen not on this team in 2025 mm -hmm. if disaster strikes contract because right now i mean two of them are not under contract and the third one of them has a 26.9 million dollar cap hit so you know those are positions that we don't talk a lot about because i don't think the chiefs are taking them in the first or second rounds but you know you've really got to start thinking about the future and if if justin reed is not somebody that you're going to be offering a contract to long term you got to look for who's going to replace him in the lineup. And if it's Brian Cook, great. Who's replacing Brian Cook? If it's Tremari Connor, great. Who's replacing Tremari Connor? He's not on the roster right now. 
So to me, that's where, you know, you do have to kind of look long term. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that will be part of our discussion, certainly next week when mm -hmm. we go through our mock draft. That's right. <laughs> yeah. We may have some bonus episodes this week. Who knows if everything comes together? Maybe some bonus episodes. We'll see. I'm crossing my fingers there. I know. I'm hoping the interviews come through this week like they didn't last week. Um, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but, yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm going to go through, yeah, because I, I went through your mock draft, and here's here's the thing I want to say about mock drafts. They're not meant to be accurate. They're meant to make you think. They're meant to occupy time, and they're meant to be fun. So anytime somebody posts a mock draft and you're like, oh, that's terrible. They shouldn't do that. Stop, man. Don't take the fun away for people. Um, and don't don't take away that joy from them caring enough to learn enough to put names to positions and try to learn more and try to go through scenarios and put that out there. Don't take that thunder from them. Don't do that. Don't be that person in life. So when people... I was sitting, like when a lot of people send me their mock drafts and I've gotten a lot of my mentions and they're like, what do you think? I don't reply to them, but the reason I don't reply to them and I see them all and I'm glad that they did it. I'm happy that they did it. But I, the reason I don't reply is the second I do, there's 12 other people to tear, tearing them down for taking the time to do that. And I don't want that person to not have the, you know, to have to deal with that. I don't want that joy taken away from them. I'm just happy they did it. Whether I do or don't think the player should go there doesn't matter. Did they have fun doing it? And that's all I care about. And that's all I ever care about in any mock draft that people take the time out of their day to do. So that's a little insider <laughs> into my thought process on that. But like, yeah, no, I mean, like I looked at your mock draft. I'm like, Hey, I, I know all the names. Yes. <laughs> and I'm like, did Matt have fun doing it? Maybe. And I'm like, <laughs> even, even if he didn't, you know, it's cool. And it's, it's just another, it creates discussion for people. It allows them to kind of think through some potential scenarios that may end up being there down the road. So it's just a win-win all around. But it absolutely, that is a great explanation. And I think it's fantastic. And it's a wonderful attitude that I, I wish more people had. But Nick, there's that that there's that spot deep in my heart that says there's one of my picks that Nick absolutely hates. I think I know which one it is, but well, you're never going to tell me. No, you say it out loud. And I will confirm it right here, right now for you. <laughs> I think it was my second. I think it was my second round pick with Austin Booker. No, I don't hate it at all. <laughs> I kind of hated it, but <laughs> I don't hate it at all. And we'll find out when we start talking about defensive ends here in a minute why and, I don't hate it. And I actually, I, I say that half jokingly because I, I actually like Austin Booker. I mean, yeah. I do. Um, I would have loved to have gotten him in the third round. I just didn't want to get him in the second no, round. But he was going to get him in the third round. Yeah, well, that's the problem. I mean, it was like uh, the I would have taken Darius Robinson if he was there. Um, I think I, I put Darius just a hair above Austin, but and really the only knock I have against Booker is you know is the the one year wonder, and we'll get into this. I don't want to be you know stepping on the, the edge, you know, and do talking about our mock drafts. Um, but I kind of broke one of my rules there because I don't mm -hmm. like taking, and I even are is I'm even poo pooing a receiver that's been mocked to the Chiefs in some places because I don't want to take a receiver that's been in college for four or five years and only has one good year. Well, Booker's a little bit different. I mean, he's been in college three years and he had one good year. He's still young. Um, probably just wasn't used properly in Minnesota, wasn't coached properly in Minnesota. And then you kind of saw what happens. So to me, there's a little bit of difference there between a, you know, maybe a 23-year-old receiver who's been in college for five years or six with COVID and a, an edge player that just maybe just seems to finally have come into himself. So that's my rationalization for breaking one of my rules, Nick. But normally I do like to see a progression of improvement and, you know, consistency. So there's that. But now that I've completely stepped on on the defensive edge group and starting it. not. You have started the conversation. <laughs> Although I will, I will add one more thing to your discussion about mock drafts being fun because – the one thing is, is that one of my weaker spots, you know, during draft prep is that I fall into the same trap that everybody else does. You fall in love with the first and second rounds, and then, you know, okay, I know I'm, I'm going to know a little bit about the third, fourth, and, you know, round, fifth round guys, you know, day two guys, you want to be able to know those. And then you get to the third day, and, you know, I mean, other than you, like guys like you who can, and Dane Brugler, who can name you 300 and 400 players that are in the draft this year, 
Um, you know, not, a, not everybody else has this kind of depth, but when I do this and then I'm like, okay, looking at who I could take in the seventh round for a Chiefs that's available, and then you stumble upon a guy like, you know, Joshua Cephas that wasn't really familiar with from Texas San Antonio, and then you're like, dude, this guy's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. You know, wouldn't have known that had I not done the mock draft. Exactly, man. So that's exactly. my that's that's my parting wisdom. So um, with that, let's get into the edges, because that I know is what you have spent your week doing is looking at edge rushers and defensive ends. It's a position that's a sneaky need for the Chiefs, I think, because one, you not only always need some guy who can get after the quarterback. But, you know, once again, you start looking at the long term roster construction, mm-hmm. even though you sign Mike Dana, you've got George Karloftis, you've got Felix and Adike Uzama. The depth kind of drops off after that. Yeah, and that's and that's honestly across all of the defensive line, but you're 100% right because, like you said, when you're looking at defensive ends, and many of you contracts up after this year, whether you do or don't bring him back long term, that's going to be up to how quickly he comes from back that, from that ACL, how strongly he performs, and if he likes the number the Chiefs are potentially offering him because whatever they offer him, you don't know if they're going to be able to offer Carl Loftus down the road whenever his contract comes up because George's arrow continues to point up as long as he's healthy. And George, the leaps and bounds he's taken from year one to year two, and even from college to his rookie year, and then even more so, like what I think he'll do this year, I just I think people are going to be really just, just fall in love with Carl Loftus's hustle and his and the work that he puts in in the off season. So yeah, like you're, like George is the next big payday. So you're gonna you're gonna have to make a decision on between him and Aminahio who you're gonna pay that that level of money too felix is kind of you're hoping can develop this year and kind of turn it into what you invested in him as a first round pick and then dan as your insurance policy for everybody like so what the chiefs paid for wasn't so p- here's the problem people keep looking at mike dana coming back here as they don't have confidence in felix and udq zama that is for that is the furthest thing from reality Because if you look at it from a logical perspective and a football perspective, again, a football perspective that actually watches coaches film, what you're going to find is he can play a five tech if you need to, to help with Felix in the run game and be able to help on rundowns and continue to let him develop. And if he has some struggles, he can fill in that spot. Then guess what? Oh, he can wander over to three and help in those pass rushing downs to help with Chris Jones but then also be able to kind of relieve in some spots. And he can pass your rush from a one tech in, in passing downs if he needs to. And, oh, hey, by the way, he can fill in over at the other at the other spot. And he's also an insurance policy for if you can't pay Karloftis or if Karloftis has an injury down the road. That's what they paid for. They literally paid for five different scenarios that Mike Dana can physically do because he's a Swiss Army knife of defensive linemen. So that is what they actually paid for. That's why they paid the money they did. And it has it has minimal to do with just Felix. So that that's my high horse there me initially, Matt. Well, I and a lot of that nonsense this week. And I was like, you're gonna squash it on 41 is the mic. And I'll get on a little high horse here and just reinforce that, which yeah. is that you know, free agency for the most part is fixing your mistakes. Mm-hmm. because you anytime in free agency, when you sign another team's player, you are going to overpay to yep. get that player. The Chiefs, even though he had a productive season, no problems with it, even with the suspension and the injury was bad luck. You're the Chiefs. You overpaid for Charles and Minnehue. Mm-hmm. But why did you overpay for Charles and Minnehue? Honestly, because you didn't hit on Joshua Kando. Because you had a you had a flaw in your roster, so you ended up having to go out and spend eight million dollars for two years, sixteen million dollars total, to fix a draft pick, to fix a hole in your roster that you did not fill through the draft. You get a second or a third, you know, round defensive end in this year's draft that can be your Charles and Minnehue for four years at a fraction of the cost. That's how you manage the cap. That's how you keep superstar players that you do draft and develop, like your Mahomeses, like your Kelseys, like your Joneses, like your Karloftises, like your Nick Boltons. The only way you can afford to keep all of those players long term is if you don't have to spend money fixing your draft mistakes. And I mean, Kendo was a miss. So if you had Joshua Kendo on this roster, you don't go out that was productive. You don't have to go out and sign a Charles Minahue. 
<laughs> Matt, you nailed it. <laughs> you nailed it. I don't. <laughs> No notes, Matt. No notes. No notes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Nick. This class, what do you think? Yeah, um, it actually was a little bit deeper than I was anticipating. I actually like this defensive class uh, collectively a little bit more than I did the defensive tackle class. I feel like there's a lot of room um, all the way into the fifth round. If you're getting certain players that fit the Chiefs scheme, I think there's still going to be guys on the board that they can develop all the way into – the the fifth round honestly and i was pleasantly surprised by that so i'm just gonna start going in order here we're gonna light this candle people have been waiting long enough my apologies matt and i enjoy having some good conversations and that's why you guys listen and we appreciate you for doing that um first one i'm gonna i'm gonna skip over dallas turner he's not getting to the chiefs really doesn't matter um uh, you know he's a talented player i'm just saying he's not gonna be there um jared verse from florida state i want to start out with him um his game is based on angles and guessing right on his attack. He has a solid burst around the edge. Uh, Verse just lacks a fluidity in the change of direction. He will either maintain the outside shoulder of a rush or cut across the face. He doesn't do a ton to set up the tackle right now. And it's just, it's all just purely angles from the snap and start. It's so there's not really as much of a plan as you would kind of really like. Um, I thought he had a good bull rush when he was coming out of his three point stance. Versus when he was standing up, um, he was able to give the good the, the uh, offensive lineman a good jolt. Um, he likes to rush from a two point stance because it's you know for him it's 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 more effective with what he does angle wise, and I think it doesn't make it a little bit more incoherent for him in terms of what he's doing or make him a little bit you know kind of lost like a navigator um, potentially on a compass or something. Find some you know find some polarization. Um, but he's going to need a D line coach that can kind of help him set up the tackles. And like I said, come up with the counters, but that kind of pair with his speed that he has. And if he does those things, I think he's going to be a premium pass rusher. It's just putting that all together right now with what he has understanding of angles and kind of his overall hustle. So I'm going to jump down. Um, so if I missed a person, it's primarily because I just, there was a lot of 34 outside linebackers in this class. So that's why if I'm skipping somebody, I think there are three, four guys. So if you're like, why didn't you talk about this guy? It's because either it's primarily one is they didn't really fit the chief scheme, but two, they're likely more of a three, four uh, outside linebacker stand up edge rusher. Next guy I'm going to talk about is chop Robinson from Penn state. That is a guy that I'm a huge fan of. Um, the only thing is standing in Robinson's way from being probably one of the best in this class is power. Like he may be the talk of this class. If he had a, a little bit more strength, uh, both upper and lower body, his, his get off and acceleration in the first five to 10 yards. It's frightening. It's like, Holy heck, like, you know, business just picked up. He's there now. Um, he, he was, he closes so much ground so quickly that he, he that's the premium that he has going for him. Um, and his change of direction and how he can reset, kind of go wide, reset immediately, boom, and have that same explosion. That's hard to do for pass rushers. Um, so for him to have that that part of it, I was I was really impressed with. He can he can add a stronger rip club and bull rush to his pass rush arsenal. Once he does that, that's when tackles are really going to have trouble with him. He's predictable now as a pass rusher, but with some strength training and adding those to it. Um, tackles aren't going to have a prayer if he if he's able to put that all together once he's been in the league long enough. Um, chop hustles hustles down the line every play takes good pursuit angles. He's a high intensity player. He's an energy giver. I I love using that from here in the coaches because I think I guarantee that comes up in the draft room a lot. So I'm just going to say it. So whenever people hear that buzzword in the press conference, they're like, "Hey, I heard that on 41's the mic." <laughs> um, but it really comes from the Chiefs front office. And above all else, like just Chop's got a really bright future. Uh, Matt, do you have any thoughts before I get to your guy for your uh, from Missouri? <laughs> well, I, 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 I that's a great transition because yeah. um, you make a great point about Chop. And you know, being more of a strength than a or speed than a strength guy, mm-hmm. um, he did not do the bench at either pro day or the combine. Yeah, and... he's going to bump him to the second round if he did. Exactly. I mean, that's the that's usually to me the sign of a guy who's not going to perform well. And compare that with I, I I'm pretty sure the guy you're going to talk about next. 
Who am I going to talk about next, man? wasn't great at the Combine, but my guy Darius Robinson pounded out 28 reps on his pro day. So, pour one out for the 28 reps on the on, on the 225 on the pro day. Of Gatorade, of course. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, with with Robinson, uh, he looks like he looks like a player that can actually bulk up. So when you read his numbers and you see him, I actually thought he's gonna be a little bit bigger than what I saw. And when I saw, it, I was like, oh, okay, he can really add on to that frame when he gets to the NFL, and he could really like. I was surprised at how light he looked on tape, size wise, and that's a compliment because like he's already got the athletic ability to it. But the the first thing that stands out about him, other than kind of the fact he can add bulk, which is a good thing. NFL teams love that. Um, his long arms, they're going to help him so much down the road. Just how long and how lengthy he is, like it's, that's going to cause some problems for O-linemen, especially guards. Guards are really going to hate him. Um, he's got Here's what I got on him. He's got a solid acceleration, change of direction. His pull and swim are tough to match up against. Um, Robinson needs lower body strength training to truly tap into what he can be as a pass rusher in the NFL. So the amount of squats he does down the road here, if he's able to enhance that explosiveness with what he's got going on long arms wise and athletically, (laughs) Oh boy. (laughs) Um, His hands have some, they got some good pop. uh, But like I said, the lower body right now is what's limiting him as a bull rusher. So like, he's got the pop, he's got the initial jolt and you're like, okay. You're like, now let's see if you can bull rush him back. And I'm like, Oh no, not yet. Not there yet. But, um, when he gets there, it's it's there's going to be some highlight reel stuff. If, and I and look, I have faith in all players, so I say when they get there, they may never get there, but in my world, they will. <laughs> and uh, he holds the, he holds the, he holds his own against the run, despite kind of the strength issue. And I think with a really good D line coach, they can enhance his counters and in a strength coach combined, those are going to be the things. I'll get to the next guy, um, Marshawn Nealon. From Western Michigan, I know the Chiefs are really big on him, and I understand why. Um, he Neyland plays with high intensity. Another one of those energy givers that is going to fire up a defensive line. Him playing next to Chris Jones, that's going to amp up Chris Jones. Him playing with Chris Jones and George Karloftis, that's going to amp them up. Then you throw Mike Dana into the mix, everybody's going to be amped up, and you don't even need that swag surf song. Like, I'm not kidding you when I say that because that's what this guy jumps out on tape with is the high intensity that he plays with, the physical style of pass rusher he is. Nealon is such a good bull rusher. He fights with his hands quickly to where it's wax on, wax off. Mr. Miyagi would be would be so impressed with what he could do. Um, he refuses to lose on a rep, which there's some defensive linemen I was watching when they're DNs, D tackles. They get to a point and they accept defeat. Nealon doesn't accept defeat. And that's something that Colin's going to love about him if he gets his hands on him. And that's why he probably had the visits that he did with the Chiefs in various capacities. And that's why the Chiefs probably talked to him a handful of times to get that character build. And I think that's something that they found to make sure that it matched up in person like it did on tape. Um, he's there to defeat blocks and uh, take the ball carrier down. He is a, He's a no-nonsense approach about what his position is, what he's supposed to do. Um He's capable of changing directions and accelerating. So there is that there. Is it elite? No. But is he able to do it? Yes. And he can line up in multiple spots along the offensive line and compete. So he could be a defensive tackle. He could be a defensive tackle loop around the end. He could be an end. He could be a wide nine. He can do all those things. And he reads and reacts very, very quickly. So Matt, that I've gotten through those guys. Let's get your thoughts. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think any of them would be good fits. I mean, the, the two that really resonate with me, obviously, are, are Robinson and Nealon, because I think that they're both players that you exactly f- described. I mean, yeah. you know, fit with the system that the Chiefs have. Robinson in particular, because he's got the ability to play every position. Um, I did not get to see Nealon at the Combine. I saw Darius Robinson and for his press conference and. I tell you what, I mean, that guy has it. I mean, there's a, you can see there's a charisma that's there. There's a, you're, there's a pro mentality that's already there. Mm-hmm. And his teammates talk about, him, I mean, the same. I mean, they're just like, this, this guy is an energy giver, just like you, like they use the phrase. I mean, he's one of those guys too. Um, I think that it, it probably is an indicator that Darius Robbins is one of those guys you fall in love with in about 15 seconds. Um, Nealon's probably one of those guys maybe you do need to bring in to get to know a little bit better, but gosh, you're right. I mean, those two players and for where they may fall, 
you, I, I mean, if they go into the second round and Robinson's maybe more likely maybe the fall than, than, than Nealon is. I'm not sure. Probably both are, I mean, you, they're both kind of neck and neck and different lists that you see. Um, but man, I think Joe Cullen would love to have either one of them and could absolutely work wonders with both of them. Mm -hmm. So I will continue the party. Um, Chris Braswell from Alabama. Braswell is a smooth pass rusher. He knows how to set up a tackle. He knows when to accelerate versus when to slow down. So there's some guys that just go 100 miles an hour, no breaks. This guy's like, well, I'm going to throttle back from three to one here in the uh, in the old stick shift and wait here for a minute and go now. Um, so like he would be a great NASCAR driver in terms of pass rushing terms. Um, and like I said, he understands angles. He He does a really good job working back to the quarterback. So like if he goes wide, he knows the angle to get back to the quarterback, whether that's looping under, if that's still working around and accelerating a little bit, he knows how to adjust in the moment to be able to get the, to get the quarterback down. He's got a good bull rush. He puts tackles on skates and I, I wrote down even stilts sometimes because that's worse. Like the way I saw him knock some people back, I was like, that's not, I can't call that skates. I got to call that stilts because skates is a little bit. I was like, that fellow almost knocked him on his keister. Um, so Braswell solid against the run. He knows how to lock out and hold. So when I say lock out and hold for some people, they're able to extend their arms out, keep the offensive lineman at bay, and then also be able to read the backfield and then toss them. So, and chuck them basically is how we used to phrase it in my day. Um, and, uh, he's got a sneaky way of creating turnovers and he, and he can play special teams. He's going to end up being a role player. So at minimum, he's going to play special teams and be a role pass rusher. You're just seeing if you can put him, if you can build with him, and if he would be somebody that Joe Cullen would have fun with. Um, going to need to continue to improve his strength, but, I mean, the hustle's there every time on the field. The athletic ability is there. The angle, understanding of angles is there. Um, but he could, be a, he could be a stand-up 34 outside linebacker. But I feel like Joe Cullen will see a lot in him. Next guy we're going to talk about, Austin Booker from Kansas and Matt's Mock Draft. If you haven't read it, go over to ChiefsDigest.com. Matt's got a whole mock. It's got all the players uh, for all the Chiefs in the in the rounds that he picked. Not all the players, but the players he selected. A couple And, of, and a couple options. that I didn't select. And, exactly. And, and some other options below. Um, so Austin Booker. Uh, Booker's long arms are hard to ignore. That's the first thing about him. He's got great acceleration and a ton of promise athletically. Right now, he's undersized at about 240 or he's listed at 240 in terms of um, college and everything, and he's going to need a couple years to bulk up. So, I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. He's going to be undersized-wise or weight-wise what the Chiefs would potentially be after. But the reason teams are going to be so enamored with him is because he, pass rushing-wise, he already understands how to swipe hands. He knows how to disengage. He knows how to set up a tackle with his speed. He's already got the, he's already got probably, uh, and I'm just going to say arguably to be safe. He's arguably got the best lateral quickness among the group. He's got the best change of direction and his closing speeds top notch. Like, I mean, he's a project. I'm not going to say he's not a project defensive end, but the athletic ability he has, that's what's going to get him whether it's in the second, third, or even early fourth round, that it, what's going to drop him is going to be teams not comfortable with the size. And if they can add bulk to him, what's going to get him in the second and third is teams being like, hey, we can do the bulk, but he's already got the athletic ability we need to potentially be a premium rusher. So that's where teams are going to have to wrestle in their room about. But that's what I'm telling you in terms of what's going to happen with all that. So, Matt, you got any, uh, you got any more? Any more thoughts right now? Yeah, Booker is interesting uh, for a couple of reasons to me. One, um, Dane Burglar noted he only played 505 college snaps. So inexperienced, but at the same time, he had 13 tackles for a loss and eight sacks in 505 college snaps. So you're talking about a player who obviously, um, one, is fairly developed, and two, should have a really high ceiling. Um, you know, maybe the floor is a little lower, but the ceiling could be a little higher. 
Uh, it's interesting to me that he weighed 13 pounds more on his pro day than he did at the combine. And yet his, you know, stats were at least his, you know, testing was almost unchanged. He was two one hundreds faster in the 40. He was like three one hundreds slower in the 20 yard split. I mean, it, you know, the, virtually unchanged, even though he put on 13 pounds. So that's at least a good indication that he can bulk up a little bit from that frame. And and put on a little bit more weight because yeah, two forty is a little light to be playing, you know, four three in for me. But if he could get more like two fifty five, two sixty, and still have the same skill set, then yeah, it's that's that's a better fit for me. But um, you're right; those arms are long. Those are old, are long arms, and he as I think you know an NFL NFL old timer scout would say he looks the part. Yeah, yeah, his arms are long. They're strong. And they're about to get the pass for Sean. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, and this one I go to Brandon Doris of Oregon. And we've only got a couple more left, just so everybody knows. Uh, Doris, is, he's really good. He's got really good quick twitch for his size. Um, he has an impressive acceleration within the first ten yards. I liked how quickly he closed. I thought he had a. Uh, I thought he had a good strong punch. I thought he had a strong rip move, a powerful bull rush to really go with it. Um, he could play three tech for the Chiefs if he could. Learn to disengage quicker when he's uh, when he's taking on run blocks. If he can learn how to kind of lock out and kind of swipe away and disengage from that, I think he can do that. Um, and he, but I think he could be a good uh, rotational edge rusher. Next one on the list for me, Brennan Jackson of Washington State. Again, uh, Jackson has good size, arm length. His acceleration would be would be dangerous in a wide nine that I saw. Like if he was in a wide nine in Seattle. I, I I wouldn't be stunned to see him in a scheme like that. He's able to use his arm length, strong lay drive, and punch to be able to create some powerful rush moves. Uh, Jackson's got a strong rip move. He's got a good change of direction. Uh, he has quick. He's got a quick spin move that I didn't expect him to have for his size, but he needs a couple tweaks here and there in the pass rush game to overall be able to put it all together. And um, if he does that, like with the high energy that he has on every play, being one of those energy givers, that's that's where I think Joe Collins, C. Spagnuolo could have some fun with him. Uh, next one I'll go to, Xavier Thomas from Clemson. Thomas is a true definition of a good speed rusher. Um, he has impressive acceleration around in the corner. I, I loved his closing speed. I think he's capable of bending and then chasing down a quarterback to close it out. His size will be his problem right now. Um, when he's going against powerful offensive tackles. So that's kind of, that'll be, like if he's going against somebody like Orlando Brown, not going to have a problem. But somebody that can maul, that can maul him um, and bury him in the dirt, like he's going to have some problems for being undersized right now. But from a speed perspective, he really fits the Chiefs scheme. We're almost done on this list, Matt. Actually, this is uh, this is actually my final guy. Or no, no, I got one more after this. Sorry. Uh, I, need a, I need a drum roll uh, sound effect, okay. but I don't have one handy. So I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, I don't. I don't know if I have rights to one either right now. <laughs> uh, Braden McGregor from Michigan. McGregor has a high drive as a pass rusher. He brings intensity with him every down. He's out there. McGregor times his deflections well. I thought he had good acceleration. He had solid quick twitch. The lateral quickness uh, you want on loops with, and we're there, and he's always driving his legs. McGregor stays in motion on a play. He's always trying to beat the block. He has good arm length, and I thought he had a good, quick inside move that is tough for guards to defend. And I think that's where there's promise to be developed as a power rusher. So I really like that. And then the final guy that I have marked down on my list of the 32 defensive ends that I looked at is Javante Jean Baptiste of Notre Dame. He's a developmental rusher. This would be like, like a BJ Thompson area. Um, he's a developmental lanky edge rusher. He's got long arms that allow him to kind of keep a tackle at bay when and he, and when he, and he does a good job reading in the backfield while he's doing it. Um, he lacks the lower body strength right now to be able to hold the edge and not get driven back. So that's, that's why he's a developmental guy, but I think he has a. I think he's got good change of direction. I liked his acceleration, and I think he would be a good with his athletic ability. I think he'd be a good special teams player and a potential rotational edge rusher down the road. So I don't. I'm not necessarily saying he'd be a starter for you, but I'm saying like he he could be 
one of those rotational guys and you just kind of see what you can do from there. But in terms of people that would become a starter for you someday, Jared verse, I think would chop Robinson should Darius Robinson should, I think Nealon would, um, I had, I, the other guy I had was a uh, Breland Trice from Washington and I skipped over him cause I only had two stars on him. It's so normally let's think about like a Yelp review. If I give you five stars. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I give you two stars. It's like, yeah, you fit, but was pretty underwhelmed. Three's like, okay, they're in the ballpark. Um, but I'll I'll break him down real quick just because I had the stars on him. Trice is a rusher, has to get stronger. He wants to utilize power moves, but doesn't have enough pop to jolt to tackle. He's capable of a good spin and rip move. He also has a nice dip move to get around the corner. His long arms and size can come in handy down the road if he gets better instincts on how to actually set up a tackle. Um, but he really needs to add a club move to his rotation. And I thought his change of direction had, had hiccups in it. It wasn't overwhelmingly bad. It wasn't like a long riding lawnmower that was making a wide turn or a semi truck that's having to make a wide turn with a trailer. I saw a lot of those at a real estate thing, uh, the other day, like some, I I didn't know how some of those guys are going to get those long, uh, I believe gooseneck trailers. And I was like, I don't know how he's going to do that. And I was like, he didn't. (laughs) So, um, but yeah. So that is what I have on the defensive ends for this class, Matt. And I know there's a lot of people that are on that I left off the list. Again, I looked at like 32 defensive ends. Those are the ones that I truly felt fit the chief system would be worth the investment, whether it's athletically. And I saw a role for each and every one of them. And and let's be clear. I mean, guys that you've heard a lot about, like a Leata Ladu from UCLA or an Adisa Isaac from Penn State, Fine players will probably be productive, but three, four yes. linebackers who right. aren't going to fit in Kansas City. Right. And yeah, and that's and that's a thank you, Matt. <laughs> thank you, because we are going to get that question. Yes. Like I said uh, earlier, that's those guys are 34 outside linebackers. And there's a lot of 34 outside linebackers in this draft class. So if a team's running a 3-4 scheme, this is actually a really good class to be able to get those guys. The guys I named are the ones that can put their hand in the dirt can rush comfortably and have attributes that doesn't just have to be for the 34 scheme. There you go. Um, this, I mean, this looks like it actually for, for a chiefs team that probably isn't going to be in the market for an edge rusher in the first round. Mm -hmm. This feels like a pretty target rich environment in kind of the second and third round, because there are some really good players in that group. Yes. And that's, and that's where I'm interested to see if the chiefs are wanting to get a defensive tackle or defensive end in this draft. I at least want to see one to help with the pass rush. Whatever it is, is whatever it's going to be. But, I mean, selfishly, I'd love to see both. But it, the defensive end, I think you got to get, in, like you said, in that second or third round, if that's what you want to do. And I'm going to be sad when Neyland comes off that board. Because watching his tape was fun. And watching Chop Robinson's tape was was awesome. So, like, those two are going to be the ones I'm secretly rooting for. But I think I, most people have Robinson looks like projecting the first round. But, I mean, I know some have him in the second. So, I mean, I'm interested to see in the eye of the beholder uh, what happens on that front. Yeah, because and a couple of local players there. And, and Darius Robinson from Mizzou and Austin Booker from Kansas. Mm-hmm. Um, both kind of tweeners. I mean, Robinson's usually been kind of a, maybe a first or a second. Booker is kind of second or a third. Um, definitely yeah. some interest there. Uh, and and two good players. Two two guys that who should be, honestly, have a decent chance of getting called on, you know, the first two days of the draft. Yes, agreed. Getting drafted in prime time is kind of fun. Yes. From what I hear and what, what it looks like. Yeah. From what I hear. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, we've, we are, we're less than two weeks away now, Nick, from yeah. the NFL draft. We are getting down to it. And so the coverage is going to intensify. Mm-hmm. Um, for sure, we can tell you this. Nick and I will be back on Tuesday night for the weekly Chiefs Digest Q&A. So come on to us uh, 7 o'clock Tuesday night, and we will answer all your questions about the Chiefs, the draft, anything else you got your mind on. Uh, we'll be here for that. Next Sunday, Nick and I are going to do our mock draft where we will pick who we would take if we were Brett Veach and discuss some of the options that are out there. Mm-hmm. And definitely stay tuned for draft the draft itself because Nick and I are going to be coming in each night afterwards for the special episodes of 41 is the mic to talk about and recap each night's draft action. Um, we both have busy coverage days and lives. So you're probably going to get pretty late in the night slash early morning. So 
probably definitely be looking at it when you wake up in the morning because it'll definitely be in your queue and here on YouTube as well. Um, there will be others. There's going to be, I've got the, some announcements are coming up at Chiefs Digest in the next week and it'll be tied in with draft coverage and beyond. And um, Nick and KSHB 41 is going to have a ton of draft coverage uh, during the week. So be on the lookout for that and we can fill you in more on the details when all those things all firm up. But um, a, a fun, busy couple of weeks, Nick. I mean, the draft is, is to me, and uh, I'll, I'll at least let a little bit of the cat out of the bag about how the sausage is made because my favorite day of the NFL year, I think, is the first day of the draft. And my least favorite day of the year is Saturday of the NFL draft. Why is it Saturday? Because it's over or what? Because Saturday is so just brutal. Mm. First of all, the, it's fast. Is it though? I mean, you're going from, you know, having 10 minutes for picks on Thursday night to by the end of it, teams are just pick to pick every 60 seconds. So it's brutally fast. Um, you just, you're going from, and especially if the Chiefs end up with a lot of picks, which they have had the last couple of years on Saturday. So you end up like doing five or six interviews and you got to be there early because the last two days you've been coming in at night and that's fun. And then, you know, you're up until two in the morning and you got to be there at eight o'clock on Saturday because, you know, there's somebody's going to be interviewed and everything. And then you got a full day of activity and, and, you know, not that I don't love the, the late round draft guys, but then, you know, you got to start trying to track down all the undrafted guys. And that Saturday is like a 18 hour day. Mm-hmm. So just hearing my whining, I, Nick loves it. So he just eats it for breakfast. It is. And Saturday is one of my favorite days. It's a high <laughs> intense action packed day. Don't get me wrong, I love all three of them. I just get annoyed that teams don't make their picks quicker in the first round and just how theatrical they make the entire thing. What I hate about the final day of the draft is how many – and just may, name the pick, let's move on. Name the pick, let's move on. Let's not go to the to the San Diego Zoo and have, a, you know, the animal – I'm not even going to name a specific animal – have the animal hit a button and take the pick. You know, like that, that, or you know, I know, I know they want to make it exciting. I know they think it it makes it exciting, but I'm just telling you, yeah, not my cup of tea. Not your cup of tea, but we do it because we love it. Yes, even even if I hate it, I I I, I love it in a way. So, I, I like so. technically I don't hate it. I just said it's my least favorite. Yeah, no, that doesn't mean I hate it. So, yep. All right, Matt, it's time to land the plane. (laughs) (laughs) All right, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, We appreciate it. Hit the like, hit the bell, hit the share, do all those things. We surely appreciate you. Leave us a review. Tell us how good or bad we're doing, although preferably just how good we're doing. Yeah, Um, leave reviews. Leave reviews on Apple because the thing you realize, if you do the stars on Apple and you do the reviews on Apple, that's what actually raises raises it up in the search engine. So if you can do that, and on YouTube too, probably, I don't know. I know YouTube works, but I know people watch. <laughs> yes, and I, I will once again. I will promise you, I because I did it a week ago, and then I, I haven't done it since, but I will do it again. I'm going to come back and answer all your questions that you post on YouTube. So if you got any questions or comments, feel free to post them on this, and you'll get an answer from me one way or the other. You may not like it, but you'll get an answer from me. So, right. on behalf of us, appreciate you listening. And Nick, until next party? time, I bid you adieu. <laughs>